Hey there. It's been a few months since I first got my Black Minimalist Tarot deck and began working with it, and I thought that it would be fun to post an update regarding how I use it, particularly how I'm using it right now. And I was in fact asked to do just that by Kasha from Tarot Map. I've linked her channel in the description. And so today I'm going to begin by showing you the deck again, how it's held up to relatively heavy use, some of the personalization I've done and continue to do. I will also share my thoughts regarding how the modifications and personalization and marking up of the cards that I do influences the way I use them, as well as share a few spreads that inform the way I personalize the deck or make use specifically of that sort of personalization. Two of these spreads are really focused on tarot study work, whereas the third is one I use specifically to explore the influence of the gods I work with on my readings, on my deck, and various spiritual trajectories. So to start off, for those of you who haven't seen my other video, which is the first one I ever posted on the topic of this deck, this is a 78 card deck that I have produced using two decks of PVC black minimalist playing cards that are commercially available. Using a combination of black and bronze sharpie, I have transformed the commercial cards that I received into a tarot deck with the usual number of minors and with the majors labeled with their associated number in bronze sharpie and with the name of the card written more subtly in black down the side of the card. Given the amount of handling this deck has received, I'm pretty happy with how well the labeling has held onto the cards, although I did want to show them to you to give you a sense of the level of wear over time that this form of marking up has suffered. I can still make out all of the numbers that are written on the cards, of course, but there has been a certain extent of fading, and that's particularly apparent near the edges of the card. So you'll note that all of these majors are more faded on the top. I use Roman numerals to number the cards, and that top bar of the Roman numerals is consistently faded throughout this deck. The black sharpie I've used primarily to cover up the suit and number reference on the majors, and that's held up pretty well, as you can see. And in general, I'm very happy and comfortable with the slightly worn look that it's taken on. Now importantly, this is all wear to the writing that I've put on the cards. The cards themselves are still in perfect condition. This is one of the perks of PVC. They are bendy, very comfortable to shuffle, super easy to clean and they hold up to handling much, much better than a paper or cardboard ever could. Now the cleaning bit is important because the cards themselves are fully waterproof, which means that when inevitably my personal labeling using Sharpies on this deck reaches a point where it's in really quite rough shape, all I need do is take off whatever labeling is left with a bit of rubbing alcohol, the cards will be good as new, and I will be able to rewrite all of this labeling, and it'll be as crisp and fresh as the first day I did it. As far as reading with this deck goes, and the absence of imagery, I've got to say that I actually really love it. As noted in my first video on the topic, I do not find it at all difficult to work with a deck without imagery, nor do I think that it is a task beyond any tarot reader who has a certain amount of experience. Obviously, you want to be fairly familiar with the tarot if you want to use this approach, but it by no means requires being a tarot rock star. This is a leap that I think sounds harder than it actually is in practice. Now I will at some point get into sigil creation with this deck. That will be its own video. Today I'm going to talk exclusively about the sort of personalized labeling and modification system that I use, which relates pretty strongly and directly to the way I work with reversals in this deck. Now a couple of months ago, I sort of found myself not really wanting to read reversals anymore. It feels like a lot of the tarot readers that I follow go through periods and phases where 
They read reversals, they don't read reversals, they change their interpretations of reversals, they go back to an original system, they drift away again. It's a process, and I don't think that there's actually inherently a preferable way to do it. There are benefits and drawbacks to either approach, and ultimately I think it's beneficial for people to try all of these different things and try them again later. Because as with any field of continuous study, when you revisit old processes, you tend to see them in new lights, and I think that's fantastic. And in my case, this drifting away a couple of months ago from the desire to read reversals was ultimately, I realized, a byproduct of reaching a point where I really wanted and needed to apply quite a lot of personalization to my use of this deck. Allow me to provide a couple of examples. The first one is the idea of bound cards, which is to say that within this deck, many of the cards are now split diagonally with one orientation remaining the standard reading of that card, whereas the other orientation will be labeled with the name of another card. And the way I read that second orientation is to interpret the card as it is influenced by that second card that it is now bound to. And here I'm going to provide you with one of the spreads I use to explore this sort of card binding, and it's this one, a basic nine card spread. Now the first card is a major, in this case justice, and the next eight cards are any card in the deck and I will work systematically through those other eight cards, considering how the energies and archetypal associations of justice impinge on the energies and ideas contained within these other cards. So as an example, considering justice from the point of view of being representative of natural law, and the balance of cause and effect, and the inherent ordered structure upon which our reality is built, the binding of justice to the Ten of Cups may then reflect the idea that the limitations imposed by the structure of this reality, this universe, are also the source of its bounty. The idea that it's the tension between opposites and the withholding of infinite options that lends meaning to our existence and provides a scaffold upon which fulfillment can be built. Sort of capturing this idea that when anything is possible, nothing is valued. This particular form of labeling is one that I do using a chalk marker, which is stable enough, but comes off much more readily than Sharpie does. And this fact, too, is one that has turned out to be a boon for the way I use this deck, in that naturally over time and over the course of use, labeling that's been done using this chalk marker fades and disappears, which means there is a sort of built-in temporal limit to how long any two, three, however many sets of cards remain bound to one another. And so at the end of that period of couple weeks of regular use, I think of it as the binding between those two cards lessening and disappearing, and now those cards are once again independent, available to be bound to some other purpose, some other meaning, which means that this deck is in constant flux. The web of influences and ties between the different cards in the deck are constantly shifting, and so the flavor of the information that this deck produces during reads is constantly evolving. Now, there's nothing wrong with binding cards, for instance, strictly for the purpose of study, but the reality is that I don't really do that. This binding you see here between justice and these eight other cards is one that emerged from ritual that incorporates tarot study in my practice, but the use of justice and the binding to these other cards wasn't arbitrary. It emerged from spiritual engagement with the concept for a specific spiritual purpose. All of which is to say that I do attribute specific spiritual import to the labeling of these cards. Now, I don't just bind cards to other cards. I will also bind them to other archetypal energies that I work with, to specific spells or rituals or concepts emerging from those spells and rituals. I may bind them to 
a very particular interpretation that emerged from a previous read, to goals and to particular relationships with the divine, for instance. Here's a tarot spread that I have been using specifically to explore and expand on how I use the tarot. Pretty meta. And although I'm sure I'm not the first person to come up with this concept, I was really delighted when it occurred to me because, frankly, it's kind of cool. <laughs> I like that kind of recursive form of exploration. The cards are positioned, as I've shown you here, with three cards on the first row, two on the second, and one on the third, for a total of six cards. And the card positions are, one, the central concept to explore in your use and study of the tarot right now. Two, a mental shift to bring to your tarot readings. That is, a novel mindset, a tweaking to your way of thinking, sometimes subtle, sometimes more extreme, to bring to the table when you interact with the cards. And so this card really encourages a break from one's typical cognitive process, one's default tarot mode that I've found can really help shed light on different ways that cards interact with one another within a spread. The same way that changing the lighting of a room really alters the overall tone, that's how I think of the second card position. It's a tonal card. The third position represents a capacity your deck possesses that it's time to explore, particularly as that applies to an applied technique, a method. Now, I'm currently working with a goddess and a god, and positions four and five represent the goddesses and god's influence on the cards, on my readings right now, how their energies shape the readings, my interpretations of those readings, where they're impinging on the cards, the spreads. And finally, the sixth position represents where you're holding back. So now, for instance, you'll note that I have now labeled these two cards that came up in the goddess and god influence positions as such, so that in a particular orientation, these cards represent the goddess or god's hand on the deck, on the spread in which they appear. As I've mentioned in previous videos, I really like and respond to the concept of trinities, sacred triplets, and have worked this sort of symbolism, that sort of relationship into my personalization as well. I am particularly fond lately of the application of this sort of triplet as it relates to temporal progression, transformation, and trajectory. The concept of progression is ingrained within the tarot. We see it very clearly in The Fool's Journey. We see it clearly in the progression through each of the suits. But I think that this progression can also be tracked across the entirety of the deck with the various suits and major akarna interwoven over the course of this journey. And for various aspects of my practice, at any given time, I'm engaged in several things, you know? There are likely to be a handful of areas of focus and interest at any given point. And not only can each of these areas have different starting points and different end points, I may be closer to the beginning on one, closer to the end on another, somewhere in between on that arc connecting start and finish. As a visual representation, picture in your mind all 78 cards forming a straight line. There are any number of ways you may choose to order those cards, but the point is it's not arbitrary. There is an order, a progression, a transformation over time. When I'm talking about these trajectory triplets, what I mean is imagine then an arc shooting up out of one of the cards in that line, arcing over all sorts of cards in between, and landing at its destination. The triplet of that trajectory then is the beginning card, the ending card, and wherever you are on that arc connecting those two cards, if you were to draw a straight line down, whatever card that line would hit. Now this last spread is one approach to 
creating and tracking these sorts of trajectories through your deck. And with this spread, I begin with the Goddess and God Influence cards, those cards that emerged from that previous spread that we did. The three cards appearing above the Hierophant here, so the card associated with this God's influence, then represent the starting point, the end point, and the point I'm at in that trajectory from this card to that card. And in case you're wondering, no, I didn't consciously select these cards. These are the cards that emerged from this spread when I originally did it. Above the goddess's card, we have her input on the trajectory, which may be general or, in some cases, a reference to a specific point on the trajectory, something to bear in mind about what's coming up or what's just behind. By the way, you can see here, hopefully, where something previously written with chalk marker has now faded to the point where it's basically on the verge of disappearing. This is what I was talking about earlier when I mentioned that the chalk fades with time, returning the card to its original unbound state. And taken together, all of these labels and notes within the deck itself then serve as specific references to different aspects of my practice, to different goals and things I'm working on, and I found have produced a really rich and flavorful experience when working with this deck that departs pretty considerably from the experiences I get when I work with a more traditional, professionally published deck like The Pagan Otherworlds, which is my other go-to. I have no doubt that as time progresses, the way I interact with this deck, the different approaches I use to modify will change. But really, there's very little restriction regarding how precisely one can use a deck that one is free to mark up on a temporary basis. And aside from making the entire process very interactive, I have found that it's engaged my creativity in a way that is not typically available using a traditional deck, or at the very least, not really readily available unless you've got a really excellent reference system and notes so that you can go back and check into everything that may be relevant for the current read you're doing since obviously you wouldn't have notes scrawled directly onto your cards. Anyway, I hope this has provided some interest, perhaps some ideas, maybe even, dare I say, inspiration. But most of all, I hope you've enjoyed this and that you have a wonderful day.